Hi. We stand between you and the lunch. <laughs> Terrible situation to be in. But we hope this is going to be interesting and fun. Uh, so welcome to the session on um, populism reawakened and what it means for high quality journalism. My name is Anita Pratap and I'm the consulting editor for The Week, which is India's largest uh, news magazine in English. So, President Donald Trump has his I word. Here today we have the P word, populism. Populism broadly defined is the narrative that the corrupt ruling elite is exploiting the ordinary masses. We know that. Reawakened tells you that populism has been around for a long time and its most destructive manifestation was as recent as the 20th century. And now populism is on the rise again. So what does this mean? We have learned no lessons from history. There are no safeguards. So when populism is rising or is surging and we have technology that has revolutionized the media, what does this mean? How do we preserve good journalism in this context? To discuss this, we have three very interesting panelists. Now, I know every moderator will hype their panel, right? It's the most interesting. But this is really an interesting panel because, let me explain, because um, we have three very interesting journalists, very experienced journalists from very different backgrounds, and they are going to give you three different perspectives on this critical issue. So, we have John Danzevsky, who is the editor at large at the Associate Press. He was the AP's international editor, as well as foreign correspondent, and he was with the LA Times. Uh, he is also handling for the AP right now. He is also handling ethics and um, standards. And then we have uh, Keelan Barr. Uh, she is the um, data projects editor in the Guardian newspaper. So. So John actually is like our, you know, historian, uh, philosopher, journalist. And Keelan is our uh, cutting edge data specialist. And then we have uh, Nina Horsek, who is the chief reporter in the Vienna-based Falter magazine. Um, she has been covering uh, populism for 20 years. She's a chief reporter. So she is our reporter from the field, reporting from the ground zero of populism. So let me start with John. Uh, John. Oh, I need a mic. Oh, yes. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. So, John, tell me, um, you've been reading a lot about populism in the 1930s. And uh, tell us, how does that, uh, what are some of the lessons we can learn from that? And what are, how can you compare and contrast what happened then with what is happening in the United States now? Well, I, I think it's not really well remembered that um, during the 1930s, there was a lot of... Um, belief that uh, the new fascist governments emerging in Europe maybe were better equipped to handle social problems because they could act decisively and, uh, and get things done and, and make the trains run on time. Um, and so this, believe it or not, uh, this, there were many prominent American politicians who had some sympathy for these points of views. And you had populism um, emerging uh, in uh, Louisiana with uh, 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 Huey Long and uh, with Father Conklin, who was kind of racist, anti-Semitic uh, uh, politicians, um, who, um, so this is, as you said, it's populism has been a, re, uh, a recurring periodic phenomenon in U.S. history. Um, in the 19th century, you had the anti-immigration riots. Uh, you had the uh, Know Nothing Party. Um, the uh, I guess it's part of human nature uh, to be somewhat tribal and uh, and also this uh, is easily exploited. This idea 
that um, by demagogues that I can represent the people against these elites. Uh, but it's also, of course, as we know from history, very dangerous. Uh, it leads to bad policy, bad decisions, violence often against minorities, and um, um, and diminishing of human rights. What the what the populist does generally is uh, delegitimize delegitimizes, excuse me, um, uh, the um, you know the elites, and the elites include uh, fact-based journalism. Uh, they include uh, independent courts. Uh, they include the legislative process, and um, so um, so I I do think that we need to be uh, ever aware of this danger of populism uh, and not let it manifest itself in the worst ways in our own times. Yeah, but um, for instance, uh, you were talking about earlier the some of the lessons to be learned from the way populism impacted media in the 1930s and what's going on now. Are there some lessons that we could learn here? Well, I think we need to be honest in our journalism. We need to, when something is racist or uh, we need to call it out, we have to stand up and be brave. I think about the uh, journalist of the, in Germany uh, in the Munich Post who uh, reported on Hitler very early uh, uh, during his political rise, talking about the corruption in the uh, in the in the Nazi Party, uh, the violence, the thuggery, and um, the hypocrisy, um, I think journalists need to do that when confronted with populism in every generation. Um, Keelan, um, the Guardian started what they call a populism project. Could you tell us some of the big ticket findings of this project? Yes, absolutely. So it was mid last year, a group of reporters in the newsroom got together and decided that, well, this is, appears to be a growing trend. We're talking about populism more and more. We're talking about populism, particularly of the right, but are we correct in our assumptions, right? Because we, how can we measure it? So we worked on a number of different stories, and one was with a group of academics, um, and Matthias Rujun and Cass Mudd are specialists in, in populism um, and classifying and identifying populism. And we wanted to look at the rise of populist politics across the world. So we looked, um, we began with Europe, and we examined how many votes had been given to populist leaders. And over the past two decades, which is something to bear in mind that this is not new, right? This is kind of this has been coming for a while. Um, but the, in the past two decades, there has been a surge in populist rhetoric throughout the world. But there has also been a surge in pop, the number of votes that populist leaders have gotten. So in Europe, in the past 20 years, that the, the share of the vote has tripled to populist parties and populist leaders. And at the same time, the other element that we decided to look at was how are populist messages being dispersed? How are people getting their messages out there? And while we've had this kind of surge in populist rhetoric and surge in popularity, we've also kind of developed social media, right? And the, the power of social media for um, amplifying and spreading the populist message is huge. And one other story that we did, which looked at this specifically, was looking at the use of Facebook in the Italian elections. And we could see that um, Di Maio and, Ren or, and um, Salvini were much more effective at using Facebook in a way than, say, Renzi. And this was because of the, the kind of nature of the message itself. So it's kind of short videos, off the cuff, folksy, more kind of personal messages um, that people really connect with through social media. So you've, you've got two things happening at the same time. The populist rhetoric is on the rise, and there's also fantastic platforms for communicating it without checks and balances. Exactly. Um, Nina, you have been uh, reporting now for 20 years. You know, uh, How do the populists try to control, manipulate, demonize independent media? And how do you cope with that? Oh, it's a big question. Um, yes, we, we, um, we don't have populism reawakened in Austria. It was never sleeping. Um, 
So the story starts in 1986 in Austria with um, Jörg Haider taking over power in the Freedom Party, FPÖ. And I think most of you probably have heard of Ibiza, the Ibiza video. We were kind of laughing Everyone a lot. This, right? yes, Did everyone hear about it? Or? <laughs> so, um, and in this Ibiza video, which was um, secretly um, taped in 2017, the, at that time, um, biggest opposition leader, uh, Mr. Heinz Christian Strache, was on an evening date with a supposed um, oligarch, the niece of an oligarch, and he thought this woman has got lots of money, some million, hundred, some hundred millions um, to spend, and he was talking with her about what to do with the money. And in this video, Strache said he wants to inst establish in Austria a media, media system as um, Viktor Orban has done in Hungary, and you all know about the press situation in Hungary. And he also said um, he wants this woman to um, buy shares of the biggest daily newspaper in Austria, and then she shall push his party into power, and, in, and then he will give her state contracts. So that's what he is talking on the video. Um, yes, he had to um, resign, and um, we have new elections now in um, September. And when I saw the video, I mean, I'm covering this party for 20 years, and I, I have to say, I didn't expect them to be that stupid. That was something <laughs> I learned, I kind of underestimated them. But on the other hand, you can also clearly see in word and picture what they think about press freedom and what, how they um, believe what's the role of the media in a democ democracy. And the media for them is to push them into power and that's it. So, um, and what the Freedom Party did in Austria, and I think it's a kind of role model for um, other parties in Europe, they started about 10 years ago to build up their own um, media empire. So nowadays, the Freedom Party has um, several magazines which are closely linked to the party. Most of them don't really belong to the party, but you can see the people writing in these magazines are employees of the party, the ads come from the party, the fin like the, all the, fin the money comes from the party. And they have their own um, TV channel on YouTube where they um, publish propaganda, which they call news. And they, um, they were the ones who were most clever with social media. So um, the now former party leader, Mr. Strache, has about um, 800,000 followers on Facebook. And we are a country with 8 million people living there, and we have about like 6.4 million voters. So 800,000 is quite a lot. And what he does is um, he takes the propaganda from the... Um, the media who are near the Freedom Party, um, puts them on Facebook and can send it to like 800,000 people with one um, click. And our biggest um, news magazine on the um, public broadcaster, they don't have 800,000 people watching every day. So that's really um, a big thing. That's the one thing. And on the other hand, they do everything to... Um, destroy the good reputation of critical media and uh, public broadcaster. Um, for example, um, Mr. Strache um, wrote on Facebook at the time when he was always the, already vice chancellor that Armin Wolf, which is the most well-known anchorman of Austria, I think yeah. he's even known in Europe, not only in Austria, mm. and he just wrote he's a liar. Mm. Mm. And um, that's the idea, like destroy public broadcaster, turn it into like state TV, independent state TV, like you have it in Hungary, like you have it in Poland, and push your own um, propaganda channels. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's, um, you know, you can always ask this question, just keep doing your job, and should you just wait for the populace and others to self-destruct? as they did in, uh, or, you know, to some extent in Vienna. The problem is, along the way, they also cause a lot of harm and destruction. And we can also say in the long run, we are all dead. But that doesn't answer 
the issue of them causing harm to institutions. We are not just talking about uh, uh, good journalism. We are talking about the you know the institution of journalism. We are talking about the judiciary. We are talking about all the other you know institutions of democracy. So, John, this is the larger issue: how whole democratic setup is undermined, and we are a pillar of democracy. In that context, what does one do? Well, I do think that um, in the case in Austria, um, in the case of, you know, historically, uh, none of these movements have thrived when there's really light shown upon them. So uh, eventually uh, they tend to overreach and, uh, and uh, if they can be shown to be uh, corrupt or, or hypocritical, that, that can uh, bring them down. And you never know where the tipping point is going to is going to come, uh, but um, I do think that one of the th important things that journalists should be doing now uh, is uh, reporting on on um, uh, on this phenomenon of fraudulent uh, news uh, masquerading as real news, uh, who's promulgating it, uh, 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 trying to quantify the amount of it, how much falsity there is on the on the social platforms. I think that's helpful. It's, it's kind of an inoculation against some of this. And I think we should also uh, work very carefully to, uh, doc as journalists, document and explore some of the underlying uh, societal uh, problems that are, 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 are raising the dissatisfaction and creating uh, the fertile uh, ground for, uh, for uh, populism to rise. And, it's kind of a cliche uh, in the U.S. Uh, around the 2016 election, uh, news organizations uh, sending reporters out uh, to uh, West Virginia and Kentucky to try to figure out what makes uh, the Trump voter tick. But I think there is some grain of truth in the fact that, uh, that uh, parts of the uh, upper Midwest and, and the southern United States had gone through horrible economic dislocations uh, that was not well reported or understood uh, on the coast. So I think uh, good journalism means uh, trying to understand the people who are prone to, to these populist sentiments, and I think that would help. I think uh, you bring me uh, right on to my next question, which was, you know, uh, the polite part is over now. Let's like uh, turn the searchlight to ourselves. Uh, we are very much, or the so-called mainstream, now that's a bad word, traditional, established media, is definitely seen as part of the elite. So when we have distance, and I remember uh, Maria was the Jakarta bureau chief, I was the New Delhi bureau chief of CNN, and 20 years before that, uh, reporting from the field, we have seen how journalism has changed, established uh, journalism has changed, and it's now part, very much seen as part of the elite. This is a fact. Um, how do we counter this now? How do we rectify the situation? Um, Kevin? Uh, it's a huge question. I wish I had the answer. Um, but what I think it helps to kind of get into the detail of that is to look at how, how we've come to this, right? So we have traditional practices in journalism, right? There's accuracy, fairness, balance. But the reality is that in dealing with populist rhetoric, perhaps those rules need to be examined, re-examined. And the issue is that populist rhetoric is perfect for headlines. And let's be honest, it has also caused a bump in readership and a bump in viewers. But that is not going to last forever. And in fact, it's actually damaging to our own work. Mm. And at the same time, this idea that we can be accurate and balanced in reporting falsehood, slander, hate speech is incredibly problematic. And I think we need to be really, really wary of that. We're not, dealing, we're not operating in the same environment, particularly when you look at the US. I mean, after the election of Trump, in the lead up to the election of Trump, it was his very populist rhetoric which made him a forerunner because what he was saying was so bombastic and so outrageous that you couldn't help but report it. But now we're kind of, we've become a nerd to that, right? It, it, it it's, it's kind of the reality now because he is the leader of the US and we hear it every day. 
per taking that approach is not necessarily correct. It, we were kind of operating from a, a place where there was a relationship that was somewhat courteous or somewhat had a bit more understanding that there would not be so many falsehoods, there would not be so many lies, that perhaps fact-checking in which we would hold people to account would help um, but it kind of counter this. I don't know if that really works anymore. Um, accuracy and balance, of course, are important. I'm not saying that we should compromise that, but it has to be. It can't be done at the cost of then spreading lies and falsehood further. Mm. How we do that is really difficult because we spend so much time correcting the outright lies that we don't get round to reporting the impact of the policies themselves. Yes. And that is the problem. And so we get caught up in reporting on populists and what they're saying and what they're doing and how different it is. And we're kind of leaving the very people who are supporting the populists behind because we're not getting to look at the impact that their policies are having on people's lives yet. In fact, that is precisely the problem, isn't it? You're playing into what the populists want and you are fighting on their turf and you have abandoned your own turf. And uh, how is this going to, you know, end well? Um, what is your experience, uh, Nina, in terms of fighting this, uh, you know, fi fighting from your turf? Um, first, I'm not a fighter. I mean, I'm a <laughs> journalist, and that's that's something important. Like, I'm not fighting. I'm not a politician. I'm a journalist. I'm reporting, and I stick on what I think is the most important thing. It's like telling it like it is. I don't want to do politics, and I don't want to get into this role. Um, what's my experience? I mean, um, I, you know, it's kind of, how to say, I, yesterday at the opening ceremony, I felt like kind of grateful that I'm living in Austria and I'm working in Austria. So, I mean, we have problems. We have um, very strong um, right-wing populism in our country, but in my country, people don't go to jail for reporting. So we are not Turkey or other countries, and we're even not Hungary or Poland. Um, we see a strong decline in freedom of press in Austria as well. So that's in the Reporter Without Borders ranking. We lost like five places, I think, in one year. So it's going down, but it's going down from a very high level. Mm. And what I to try to do in my everyday work is... Um, um, what am I doing? I try... Um, to keep good manners and not to take over their bad manners. Like, you know, I'm used to, um, if I try to get um, a comment or an interview, I often don't even get an answer or they just say, no, we talk, don't talk to you. There is like attacks on Facebook. Um, you know, yesterday I um, published an article with new evidence that the former FPÖ leader Strache was um, even longer in the neo-Nazi scene in Austria than we knew before. And today people write on Facebook, um, like, look at this um, disgusting lady. Um, if I meet them at her at night, I will jump on a tree or whatever. So trying to kind of silence you with, like, um, hate speech. I try not to take this personally because it's not against me as a person. It's because I do my job. And I also try to react with a kind of sense of humor. I think that's very important. Like another example, I wrote something um, which the FPÖ didn't like at all. And then they started on um, like campaigning against me on Twitter. And they sent out a very important um, communication guy from the party attacking me and then I react and wrote on Twitter, um, it's Sunday afternoon, it's a nice Sunday afternoon, so that the Freedom Party sends out this um, very important employee on this nice day means um, I hate a spot. So that's what I do. And, and also um, I try, you know, the populists, they do one thing, they divide the world into good and bad, and the good ones are just good, like mostly the people, and the bad ones are just bad like refugees for and whatever. And I think it's very important that we don't start to take over this black and white thinking because there are lots of shades of gray in the world. And if we start now um, reporting on the, the populists the same way and say we are the good ones, we are the journalists, uh, 
fighting against the bad ones, then I think we do the same what they do. And I think that's kind of dangerous. That's a kind of a tit for tat, which is a dangerous uh, trap to fall into. Um, but at the same time, there is also this issue that populists always give out their messages in exactly as you said, it's black and white, whereas reality is much more nuanced, is much more complex. So it's easy to send out a black and white message, whereas it is much more difficult and demanding to send out a holistic a, a, a story which we as journalists have to present, which is you know capturing all the nuances and the complexities and at the same time having the hard-edged you know, uh, news uh, headline. Um, this is asymmetrical. How do we handle this? Um, I think it's important for journalists to be um, um, as as in the as the uh, as the prior panel indicated. Journalists need to be out in the communities. They need to be uh, they need to be not elites, but they need to be talking to people uh, um, respectfully, getting information. Uh, our, our newsrooms need to better reflect the uh, populations that we're covering, which is a, a, a real weakness in many newsrooms, uh, and all sorts of diversity, uh, including economic diversity, regional diversity, gender diversity, uh, geograph uh, 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 racial diversity. So um, I think that's one way we can sort of avoid some of the mistakes of, of speaking down to people if we are with the people and are seen as being with the people. Um, so now I'm starting to sound like a populist. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it's really important. Philosopher to uh, populist. To, uh, I think it's really important that, um, that uh, we both cover th this movement and its uh, darker, more destructive aspects, but also uh, try to understand uh, its appeal and report on that as well. You know, this morning, we, uh, the first session, it was an extremely interesting uh, session. And um, the person that was, uh, or the organization that was missed most by all the members over here was Facebook. So my next question is about fake news. And I want to ask Keelan, um, is data the magic wand to handle fake news? No. No. <laughs> the data specialist telling you no. OK. <laughs> I don't believe it is. Um, so I'm the editor of the data projects team. And we work on kind of generally investigative work um, that is based in data. So we'll run projects, say, on populism or on the gender pay gap or on rape prosecutions. And it's all based in data. So we base our reporting in kind of facts and then send reporters out into the field to kind of report on what we're seeing in, in data. Um, and that is massively powerful. It, it helps us build really um, impactful stories because you have the element, all the elements that you want of a story, right? But at the same time, I don't know that it really serves the purpose of countering a populist narrative because it's about presenting facts. And so if you're just presenting facts and numbers, um, it's kind of one versus the other. And it's really a matter of, of who's got the mic. And this is kind of where Facebook comes in again, right? So if you've got a huge platform and a huge audience of 800,000 people on YouTube, which is much bigger than any of your broadcasters, does it, does it matter how accurate you are if the other side isn't being accurate and doing its fact checking and balance as well? What about the, the issue that their messages are always emotional, yeah. whereas yeah. facts are not emotional, yeah. you know, it's rational. So again, it's an asymmetrical uh, situation where we have to deal with facts which are not emotional and then they are dealing with uh, lies which are highly emotional and, uh, you know, arousing all kinds of, you know, sentiments. So again, in that context, again, as you said, right, the, the asymmetry there, as you pointed out, and when it comes to dealing with emotions, which is not our business. Uh, so then what do we do? It, it, it is a huge challenge. Probably the, the best example that I have from my work in recent years is covering the gender pay gap. And so in that, my concern the first year that we were covering the gender pay gap, um, it, was, it was basically the first time that every company in the UK with more than 250 employees had to say what their gender pay gap was. And my concern as the editor was thinking, 
oh, maybe these companies are going to come back and tell us the figures are wrong. Perhaps we're going to get, you know, we're going to do the, we're going to get the framing wrong. We're going to get some of the figures wrong. We're, I was concerned about the accuracy in how we were reporting things. What I wasn't prepared for was the kind of conversation that came from the reporting, which was that the gender pay gap does not exist, right? So my idea was let's be accurate and fact-based and balanced in a reporting on it. But the kind of conversation and what spun off from it was does this thing even exist? And the, conver the kind of narrative around, it's, it's, it's kind of based in culture wars, really. Um, it's kind of this narrative around um, whether gender is an issue or whether it's a matter of choice, right? Whether your, your options in life are a matter of, of your own personal choice, which really comes back to politics of kind of thinking of the, f of free, the influence of the free market. And this really kind of comes from think tanks and uh, influences then politics and political and cultural conversations around the gender pay gap. So my approach of kind of presenting the facts and hoping that that would be enough is not enough, right? That, so in, in our coverage of the gender pay gap, it really opened my eyes as to presenting this as kind of a, a numbers-based, a fact-based kind of inquiry is not where the conversation's at. That's that's a starting point. But really, the conversation is much further down the road. And it is emotive. And it, it very much, I mean, the thing with conversations on social media is very often they are based in emotion. They are based in kind of personal connection. And if we're not thinking about that space or trying to understand how the conversation plays after it leaves our platforms, then we're missing a trick. Yeah, I, I think um, some of the panelists in the earlier sessions also mentioned this. Um, but one of the things as journalists you realize, you know, um, is that there are no boring stories, only boring storytellers, right? So even facts can, you know, be presented in a way which is not uh, hyper emotion, but in a way that the audience, you know, connects with. And that can be done without a problem. What, what would you say, John? Uh, yes, for sure. I, I, I think... Uh, facts are incredibly powerful things, but but you also need good storytelling. So you need to you know find the example, uh, the person who can um, you know uh, personify your story, uh, whatever it is, what your narrative, and uh, draw people in. And it, it usually is uh, an emotional connection you're looking for with the reader to make it happen. But I do think. Uh, like in the case of your your data, uh, we need to do better as journalists in showing uh, where we get our facts. We need to be transparent about our sources. We need to be prepared to uh, defend them because uh, a, a fact is something that's that is verifiable. It can be checked by somebody else and see if you had it right. So I think. One of the things we can do more of uh, is uh, to include in our journalism our links, you know, show our documents, uh, show where we got the information. In the rare occasions where we use anonymous sources, we should explain how, why the source we're using uh, knows what they're talking about and, uh, and provide, you know, some kind of context for why they need it not to have their name used. And there's all sorts of um, transparency issues that uh, can bolster the credibility of our journalism, and, uh, and I think that's also an important thing we can do. Um, I remember 20 years ago, long before social media, I read Edward de Bono. I'm sure many of you have read uh, the author. Oh, sorry, I'm sure many of you have read this author, Edward de Bono. Um, I read him 20 years ago, long before social media, as I was mentioning. And he talks about the, uh, the rock logic of, uh, the, the rock of logic and the water logic uh, of perception. So there is the rock logic of facts and the water logic of perception. And his thing was that it's not enough uh, just to talk about the uh, the rock logic uh, of facts, you have to address the water logic of perception, which is not scientific, which is not rational, which kind of goes, it's very iffy. But I found that helped me as a journalist because whenever I was writing an article, I also realized I have to address the perceptions of my viewers, which might be totally different from what I, people all have preconceived notions. So that perhaps helps, but now, 
with social media and the kind of very, very advanced systems that we are going to see in social media. Today, for instance, we have deep fakes and uh, how people's faces uh, can be mimicked and their voices can be mimicked. And then you have, I'm just thinking in the context of, you know, uh, Russia or United States or, you know, India, Pakistan, and you have, you know, the leader saying something really outrageous about the people of the other country, then what does this mean for journalism? How do we respond to this, uh, and we are uh, one of the, you know, front lines, you know, in this kind of a situation. What does this mean for politics? What does this mean uh, for society when information cannot be believed? We have reached that stage. So um, it's thrown open, you know. Uh, give us some insights as to, you know, in this situation of uh, very, very advanced manipulation of misinformation, how do we function as journalists to preserve our quality journalism? I think the technological aspects are quite terrifying. You mentioned kind of deep fakes in particular, and that that's a huge issue. Um, I also don't have the answer for that, to be honest. Um, but I do think that even if we go back to, to basics in thinking very, very carefully, um, I think we need to re-examine the language with which we address populists. And we need to question in our reporting are we reporting on them or are we doing their publicizing for them, yeah. right? And that is really, exactly. really important. Um, one example that I've noticed um, in reporting is particular players within popul the populist movement or the kind of alt-right movement as well within the uh, US. So Milo Yiannopoulos at the very beginning was addressed in many articles as a activist. Um, and the word activist has a lot of connotations. And, you know, it, it's, it gives the idea that he could also be aligned with people who work for Greenpeace mm -hmm. or who work for Amnesty International. And it's or, not our job and, to be activists, uh, right? Uh, well, that's, I mean, the, the idea that he is an activist or that he would be addressed as an activist, I think is incredibly telling of where our mindset was at the time. Mm -hmm and that perhaps we weren't really prepared for what was coming or what, was, what we were actually being confronted right. with. And now when you look at BuzzFeed coverage um, of Yiannopoulos, he is addressed as a right-wing troll. <laughs> and perhaps we should have seen that at the beginning yeah. rather than it, it took us a couple of years to get there. Yeah. And I words think it's... Words matter. Yeah, words really, really matter, especially at this point in time yeah. where... It's, things are changing so quickly that it's only in retrospect that we're, re it's, it's happening so fast mm. that it's only once the horse is bolted we're realizing maybe we got that wrong. Maybe we were being a little bit too balanced, a little bit too fair at that mm. point, thinking that this was somebody who, to whom the normal rules did apply. When actually he was on podiums calling himself a troll. So, you know, perhaps we should have addressed him as he was addressing himself rather than calling him. Do you feel you legitimized him, gave him a certain credibility and respectability? I think he was very good at that himself. <laughs> um, and that's, that's where kind of social media comes in as well, right? It really allows you to project the image that you want to have. You, construct, you can construct your own image. And at a certain stage, we, I think as the media, hadn't really copped onto the idea that this was a problem and that the, the, the image that you construct is not necessarily the truth, right? So, but we were reporting it in a kind of accurate, balanced way. I do think that language is, is, is important. Um, one thing we did at the AP was uh, we uh, banned the use of the uh, uh, alt-right as a description and, and preferred to say, you know, um, uh, a racist uh, commentator or something like that because um, uh, we've also recently in our new style book have told people not to use euphemisms like uh, racially tinged, just say racist. And uh, um, I think this kind of direct language is, is part of what we were talking about earlier. We need to uh, uh, be, uh, be reporting on uh, these movements in, in a way that doesn't pull punches. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. And I think it's uh, history has shown that that, that is um, one thing you need to do. You need to be plain.
Across the world, we have seen press freedom shrinking, and it is, you know, in some places, the attack on the media is direct. In others, it is self-censorship, as we've seen in, you know, India, Pakistan, and uh, even in the United States. We've seen actually a lot of uh, steps being taken, whether it's relating to the Espionage Act or surveillance. We have seen press freedom shrinking around the world. Um, how is, what is the best way to deal with this? John, Nina. John, you start. <laughs> well, I think we're sort of doing it today in, in conferences like this. We need to talk about our work uh, among ourselves and go out and talk to uh, the public about the value of journalism and how we do our job and, um, and, and, and the value and powerful of facts and people knowing facts. Um, so, um, uh, and I think it's good, as, as you pointed out, to start from the assumption that journalism is under attack, uh, and journalists are under attack everywhere. Uh, so there's never a better time than now for journalists to work together, form coalitions and alliances, and, uh, and defend the work, and uh, defend uh, the safety of journalists, uh, the physical safety, the safety from harassment, and the and 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 uh, the need to create space and keep pushing the envelopes to be able to report on governments, on on uh, corrupt officials, uh, on uh, on uh, uh, populist uh, anti-democratic movements. Uh, we just it's not a game anymore. We need to we need to fight back. Um, you know, you want to say something? Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, in Austria, we never had a problem with freedom of press. We were just used to it. We didn't even talk about it. It was just normal. And also for the people in Austria, um, we never talked about why do we have public broadcasting. It was just um, turn on TV and there will be ORF1, ORF2, and that's normal. And um, then we had, um, from 2017 on, we had the um, extreme right in power in the government, and suddenly they started attacking um, the public broadcaster, um, attacking critical media. We had um, in the Minister of the Interior, there was an um, official um, letter written to the um, press officers of the police um, departments telling them to give what they called um, critical media only um, just the information they have to for legal reason and not one sentence more. And they, um, in this letter, they named three different media, two um, newspapers and my um, weekly magazine and said, um, if the falter calls, just give them information you have to for legal reason, nothing else. We never had that before in Austria. But that will make better reporters out of you, right? You'll go out. <laughs> no, thanks for training. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the training. No, um, I mean, we still got our information because we no, have our yeah, channels. You navigate your channels. But it you? shows the mentality. The, yeah, the mentality of these um, politicians. Yeah. And um, we were really happy about the Ibiza tape because we knew after the EU elections, the net, next big project will be a reform of the public broadcast in Austria. And seeing the attacks from the Freedom Party, um, on the public broadcast, we knew it's not going to be getting better. Then, like it's going to be going to the, into the direction we see in Poland and in Hungary. So that was something good. But what we also learned is um, people will only defend quality journalism and will only defend um, public broadcasters if they understand why they are so important for democracy. And we kind of failed telling the people about that. We are just used to it. We, I never thought about a problem of the freedom of the media in Austria. You know, in fact, you bring me to uh, what is the elephant in the room, which is that we've been talking about how social media has impacted content and taken away viewers and readers, but they have hijacked ad revenues. So uh, the established media is under a lot of financial stress in many countries. Um, how do we, and this also, and good journalism 
is time consuming, it is expensive. So how do we deal with this kind of a situation? Uh, is crowdfunding an answer? Is public funding an answer? How do we maintain the health of the independent media so that we can continue to have good journalism? I think it's kind of easy. You have to tell the people if you want quality information on time, it's not going to be free. If you want free information on time, it's not going to be quality. So if you want on time, you have to pay for it or it will be not good. I mean, it's the same with everything. If you go somewhere, if you go to a shop and if you buy a T-shirt for one euro, it won't last for 20 years. Yeah. I have a good example of how um, finances affect me, you know, good reporting. Um, I was watching, uh, for instance, uh, you know, one journalist, from, a young reporter from obviously a media that uh, doesn't have much money. Um, and so they are now ill-trained. A lot of the reporters who are out on the field are ill-trained. And so, you know, she goes up uh, to Steve Bannon and says, are you a racist? And he says, no. And then he walks off. That's the end of the story. I mean, and at the same time, I invite you to watch this, you know, uh, with this globalism, uh, um, uh, populism project that they, you know, the, uh, the Guardian has, because there, your editor, Paul Lewis, confronts, he has a half an hour segment on Steve Bannon. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant in terms of confronting him with facts and figures, but that requires time and energy and uh, money. And so that's, you know, there and a real issue that we need to also address. But we are getting close to our closing. Can I say one oh, yeah, more yeah. thing? Please. Like in Austria, when we realized um, in 2017 that we get more and more problems and we looked around, you know, next country is Hungary, Poland is not so far away, um, we started to connect. So we built a network of journalists focusing on the extreme right and the right-wing populists in Europe and we're working together, like we're working together with Martin, who's also on the panel, he's from Hungary. I'm working together with the Tats in Germany, with the colleague who's focusing on the AFD, with the Liberation in France, and with many more. And that also helps. And we, on Italy, we have the Internationale as a partner. And we wrote articles telling people, like, look at these countries, what's happening there, um, how the media gets mm. problems, but also the civil society. I mean, if you have a decrease of press freedom, you always have a decrease of um, civil society movements. They get under um, stress. So that's, you have to tell people about that. Um, are there any questions for our panelists? Yes. Um, I'm Marty Steffens. I'm a professor from the University of Missouri. I guess the gist of my question is whether or not sometimes the statements and outrageous kind of actions of, of populist movements kind of end up moving independent media a little bit to the left, kind of in a reaction kind of way. And let me give you an example. Uh, the Secretary of Agriculture in the Trump administration is not a particularly liked person, and so he uh, decided that he was going to disassemble all of the data uh, that is being kept in Washington and create a new data center in the middle of the US. Well, the reaction of the, of the press was to write about how all of these people who've been keeping data in Washington, DC are resigning and because you know their data center is going to be moved to the Midwest. But the secretary's rationale was, why don't we create a data center in the middle of the country closer to the agriculture you know, that they serve? And so it was really interesting to me, and I got questioned on this, and I said, is it necessarily a bad thing to move the data center in, in the middle of the country? We're so used to like reacting in kind of a knee-jerk way that maybe when they do come up with something that's maybe not quite so wacky, um, that we have a tendency, because so the Washington Post and New York Times, or everybody wrote stories saying, all these people in Washington are losing their jobs, you know, who, who kept the data. And, you know, and they were concerned about it. And I just said, well, you know, wh why, do, why do we always be, get in this position where because somebody yeah. says something a little bit different and the way they say yeah. it, we kind of end up doing We have to criticize for the sake of criticizing. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. No, I, I don't think so. Uh, yeah. I think, uh, you know, I think what we've been talking about is, is having... Uh, good reporting and thorough reporting, and I think a, 
a thorough report on that would have, you know, explored the rationale and the reasons for doing it. So, um, just as an example, so, but I mean, again, facts and in-depth, thorough reporting, I think, uh, uh, help us to avoid uh, yeah. uh, those kinds of errors. That's yeah. what they say. Uh, reporters these days are more opinion. It's more yeah. opinion than you know, and that's not uh, that doesn't help our cause either. Yeah. Yes, please go ahead. Um, Daoud Kutab, Community Media Network in Jordan. You asked a question about whether freedom of expression is lower or higher. I think it's a mix because um, on the one hand, I can see a lot more people able to speak out because of the digital revolution. On the other hand, there are some big monster media outlets that are really controlling most of the narrative. And I think one thing we need to kind of talk about more is how to connect these small groups that are really expressing uh, genuine thoughts and genuine local ideas into the, the big atmosphere of the big media outlets. Okay. That is a statement, but not a question, right? <laughs> okay, please go ahead, yes. This Hassan Hassan Mujama, Dr. Hassan Mujama from Jazeera Center for Public Liberty and Human Rights. I have uh, also I have comments, short comment. I think it's better to uh, it's very important to to give the audience uh, or to raise awareness about the distinguish between the freedom of expression and hate speech. And sometimes all the audience they did not know anything about the what's the difference between the uh, freedom of expression and press freedom and hate of speech uh, if if we can do something uh, like a promo or filler on our screen or, or the uh, a first page of the newspaper it will help us because uh, every time most of the inter international regional or national media organization publish a hate speech from the uh, from the uh, the officer, from the president, from the minister around the world, and uh, it will support the conflict uh, uh, exactly in the as you see in the Africa in the uh, in the in the MENA, we have a conflict, and sometimes the the media coverage is support this is a conflict. It's not supporting the human rights and uh, and public liberties. Thank you. So you also have a statement. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Statements are fine too. But yes, please. Um, thank you, Yara Bazir from Syrian Center for Media and the Freedom of Expression. Can you talk I... a bit louder. Okay. Uh, Yara Bazir from Syrian Center for Media and Freedom of Expression. Um, I want to thank, uh, I think, uh, the one who spoke about the language, I think, Mina. Uh, and I want to say about the language on another level. For example, how, uh, my question is, how, how do you think uh, chief editors are responsible for the language effects? Because, for example, when, we, um, when I look to BBC Arabic, actually, I feel they are using a different level of language uh, than BBC English with the audience of each of them, you know, as there is uh, some kind of a previous uh, study about the level of understanding for the Arabic audience or something, you know, uh, I would say we feel like, I feel, I feel, it's just a feeling, uh, BBC English probably using higher level of, of, of language, uh, maybe more academic, more uh, technical language, which uh, not necessarily always you find it, and the same with uh, uh, France, Van Kat, Arabic and Indo English, and etc. cetera. Um, for example, Al Jazeera uh, doing this investigating report, and they show it now in Arabic, and, and this is very good because it has this kind of language, but I'm not sure we also have the same on other channels, you know. And my second question is about uh, also the responsibility. Uh, when, uh, how much media are uh, responsible for uh, uh, stereotyping? Because stereotyping, because for example, in 2013 in Germany, we had a lot of articles about the great refugees who are finding money in everywhere and send it back, or I don't know what they did. And then suddenly in 2015, you are going to find everyone writing about the bad refugees, you know? Uh, for example, there was an accident about uh, a refugee harassed a lady in a beer festival in Germany. And if you Google it, you will find a lot of reports about harassment issue happened in the same festival beer since 60 years. We know. So your question is? 
how we are, how much we are responsible about the stereotyping. Stereotyping. Or, 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 how much um, are we responsible for stereotyping? And the language. Uh, and the language. I have kind of thoughts on all the questions. Um, but stereotyping in language, um, I think that that is a huge problem when it comes to populism, for like the with the rise of populist rhetoric in particular, um, because it, it does, it it is stereotyping by its nature, right? So the idea is that there's good and bad and everybody fits into one category <laughs> or another. And so we have to be very careful in our language as to how we present and report on it. But the point that you make in relation to kind of um, language and how we how we kind of report on local issues as well, which is what um, another Syrian colleague over here mentioned, and um, this lady as well, when you were talking about how do how do people or why is it that we report from the idea of black and white? And I think it's because we've kind of lost the middle to some degree, right? We've lost some local reporting in all the cuts and all the ra kind of race to keep up with social media and social reporting on social media. We've forgotten about the people that we're talking about. So we're talking about populism, but populism is on the rise for a reason. And we are seen as the elites, and that is a huge problem. But we're not going to be able to kind of shake that cast that image off unless we engage with people on their own terms. So if you had a reporter in the Midwest, they might have piped up and said, well, actually, we really need some jobs, and that might be a really good idea. It might be more rele relevant to have a, cent a data center here. And it's also the same issue with kind of local reporting, and kind of and, and which relates to your question, too. So this idea of it's, it's a commonality in all of, the, all of the, the questions, actually, is about local reporting. And why are we here? Why are we here talking about populism? It's because we, we haven't always served our audiences. And I think we have failed to connect with our audiences in some, in some respects. I'm a fan of a clear language. I, I think, I mean, I'm working as a journalist, I'm writing articles and I want them to be read. So I don't, I don't write prosa. I'm not a romancier, I'm a journalist um, trying to tell people what the world is like. And um, yes, that's. We take one last question from Ravi, please. Thank you. I am. Ravi, publisher of the Hindu group of newspapers from India. Uh, going back to the original question raised by Anita on the lessons to be learned, this is addressed to John. Uh, John, you spoke about uh, the media shining the light on populist movements to expose their infirmities and also focusing on the underlying problems that give that enables populism to come to the fore. Uh, at another dimension of ideology, Liberal democratic voices seem to have very little in their toolkit to counter the onward march of, say, hyper-nationalism. How does the media deal with this kind of ideological gap or infirmity? Well, uh, that's a very good question. I, I think I, I look back to the, um, to, um, again, to the 1930s, where uh, liberalism did rally to, um, to overcome extremism. Uh, and sometimes it, uh, democratic societies uh, uh, work uh, slowly sometimes. But if you have functioning institutions, uh, generally, I think they get to the right place. And, uh, and conversely, I think authoritarian institutions always carry the seeds of their own destruction within them because eventually the, the pressure builds up and defeats them. But I think we're all involved. I think we all need to uh, speak out in favor of the, um, not, I mean, not when we're being journalists, but when we're being citizens, uh, speak out in favor of the values that, um, that uh, we believe in. And, um, you know, in the end, it is a, a contest of ideas and ideologies. So um, uh, it, it is incumbent on journalists to do the, the kind of good, thorough, non-stereotypical uh, reporting, but actually based on uh, witnessed facts and verifiable facts. And for people who are in the, the public um, arena to speak in favor 
of the values that support uh, you know, all of our freedoms, uh, journalism, uh, freedom of religion, freedom of thought, freedom of expression. Well, populism thrives because there is grievance, because there is injustice, because there is inequality. These are all the reasons that most of us were driven to become journalists. So we just have to continue doing what we're really good at and hope for the best. Um, Keelan, Nina, John, thank you so much for a wonderful panel. And thank you all for being such a wonderful audience. And now for some much needed lunch. <laughs>